Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us at today's webinar, Navigating International Arbitration in Canada. Uh, we still have a few people in the process of dialing in, but we are a few minutes past the top of the hour, so let's get started. Uh, we are here today to canvas key differences in international arbitration between Canada and United States. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce the discussion with my colleagues from Canada to help assist U.S. businesses and understand how to navigate international arbitration in Canada. Exactly a month ago on February 10, we ran the first webinar in the series and looked at the international arbitration in the United States for Canadian businesses. We will circulate the link to that event in the post-event communication, and you may also find the recorded webinar on Denton's website. I encourage you to reach out to us directly if you have any questions. Uh, just a few housekeeping remarks at the outset. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them at the Q&A feature. We will be monitoring that and we will do our best to answer your questions as they arise. Uh, this session is also being recorded and it will be distributed, as I said, after the event in case you miss some of the, what I'm sure will be a lovely and encouraging discussion with this panel. Lastly, for those getting CLEs for this year, uh, the webinar window must remain open for the entirety of the program and it must be the only window on the forefront of your screen. WebEx will detect if you minimize the program or use the computer outside the webinar software, and this will prevent you from earning CLE credit. CLE credit for the live webinar is being sought in Arizona. I am Dior Ziaeva. I'm counsel with Danton's New York Litigation and International Dispute Resolution Group in the United States. Um, my practice focuses primarily on arbitration, international commercial, investor state, and domestic. So I will do my best to moderate the discussion today. Our speakers are Mike Schaffler, Rachel Howie, and Chloe Schneider. Uh, Mike Schaffler is a commercial litigator with over 25 years of extensive experience handling significant bet the company dispute. He also acts as counsel on many large international and domestic arbitrations. Mike is the fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and holds the QR designation. Mike is a member of the Denton's Canada Management Board. Next is Rachel Howey. Uh, she is the dispute national lead for international, uh, for Denton's Canada Litigation and Dispute Resolution Group. Her practice focuses on international and domestic arbitration litigation, primarily in the energy mining and natural resources industries. She has acted on arbitrations involving issues across Canada and South America, Central Asia and Southeast Asia under several institutional rules and ad hoc. And last but not least, we have Chloe Snyder, the partner in Denton's Litigation and Dispute Resolution Group. Chloe practice focuses on complex commercial litigation arbitration. Chloe has particular expertise in dealing with enforcement of and appeals from arbitral awards. So without further ado, we move on to the substance of our discussion. I will turn over to our panel and introduce, to introduce the topic of what are common institutions and rules in Canada. Um, so Mike, can we start with you to discuss uh, common institutions and rule in Canada and the seats? Well, thank you, Theora, for the introductions. And um, let me just indicate, you can see from my camera that it does, uh, there is some sunshine in Canada uh, as we get into March now. And, snow that you hear about in the news is mostly fictional uh, it's lovely here uh, for those of you that haven't visited you should you should come on up um, we're very friendly so um, in terms of the agenda you can see 
the key areas that we'd like to cover. Uh, we, we would like to encourage participation. Uh, there's a chat function. Um, and, and so please uh, throw questions at us uh, if, if you want to. Uh, I think all three of us, you'll find are fairly approachable human beings. Um, and um, if we could go to the next slide, please, um, and the one after that, what I'd like to what I'd like to just give you first is sort of a flavor. Uh, I think it's really important when you're dealing with a you know with a different country <clears throat> uh, for our uh, many of our American colleagues. It's important to understand you know what it's like. What does it feel like? So I wanted to just talk a minute or two about our culture up here. And you see a bunch of acronyms. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to those in a minute, but uh, stepping back and looking at the big picture just for a moment. Canada was 1 of the 1st, if not the 1st signatories uh, to the 1985 model law. And you'll see later um, when we talk about how our constitution divides between federal and provincial responsibilities. That model law has become the backbone for much of our arbitration legislation throughout our uh, throughout our federation. And <clears throat> shortly after the model law was enacted, uh, which of course deals with international arbitrations, the uh, our courts began to decide cases where civil litigation and arbitration worlds were clashing, and typically parties were seeking stays. Uh, whether under the domestic or under the international uh, uh, law uh, in favor of arbitration. And so a, 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 a flavor of uh, judge-made decisions emerged in the late 1980s and in the early 1990s that really set the gateway towards a very uh, arbitration-friendly culture. And it has remained that way all the way up to the Supreme Court of Canada which has weighed in on a number of occasions in the last 10 years or so on some very important uh, issues. Um, now, there are limits, as you'll also hear a little bit later, where the friendly arbitration culture tends to get less friendly is in the area of consumer disputes. Uh, in fact, many of our uh, jurisdictions have enacted legislation to countervail forced arbitration, to use that term, and the Supreme Court of Canada has weighed in on that as well. Unlike the U.S., we don't have a very strong, uh, in fact, we don't have any class arbitration uh, culture or experience for that matter. And uh, there's, I've written on that, um, some of my colleagues have written on that. It's largely a function of our constitution and uh, a lack of uh, legislative framework which I understand is a little bit different in the US. I think the AAA, for example, has arbitration, uh, class arbitration rules, if I'm not mistaken. So we don't have that here, but it's being discussed. Um, so when you look at the slide, you'll see uh, the ADR Institute of Canada. It's the leading domestic organization. It has about 2,200 members. Uh, I'm one of the members of the, uh, the board of directors. I'm also the president elect. And Dentons Canada is one of the about 25 corporate members uh, who shape, who tries to shape the, uh, arbit the domestic arbitration picture, if you will. We put that up there, though, because ADRIC has adopted a set of rules that are equally usable for an international arbitration on an unadministered basis. And they're very good rules. They have emergency arbitrator provisions, the, the stuff that you will see you know, with the other international institutions like the ICC, the ICDR, AAA, L LCIA, et cetera. You'll see also the uh, VANIAC, the, the Vancouver International Arbitration Center. Vancouver has a very uh, mature arbitration culture, mostly as a gateway to the, to the far west, as you can imagine. Um, um, we have the International Center for Dispute Resolution, and we have CTAC as well, which are you know, these are prominent names that 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 are you know that our arbitration community is is very familiar with. We organize ourselves in Canada around a number of prominent uh, societies or or groups, which are just you know arbitration geeks like me who like this stuff. 
Um, you have the Western uh, Canada Commercial Arbitration Society and effectively the sister organization in Toronto, which is the PTCAS, Toronto Commercial Arbitration Society, very well represented, very, very well known um, um, representatives in the international arbitration community out of Canada. So if you if you ever heard about the doping report and all the cases about alleged doping in Russia, Dick Pound um, and uh, and Richard McLaren, for example, these are some of the players in that community that 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 hail from from Canada. If we go to the next slide, please touch briefly. Um, uh, next next slide. There we go. So. Um, one one other feature and and something that's important when you're talking to clients in particular and you're and you're looking for advice on seats of arbitration, um, Toronto in particular has over the last few years positioned itself as a very uh, international arbitration receptive center. Arbitration place, which is just across the street from here. Uh, is a, a real chambers where we have about a 30 or so very prominent arbitrators. Some are retired Supreme Court of Canada judges, some other Court of Appeal judges, and others that are private arbitrators like Brian Casey and the like who, who, who decided uh, that they wanted to be independent as opposed to with a, a big platform. So that is a very uh, uh, user friendly place in the old days before COVID, we actually used to meet in person and we would have arbitration hearings over there in their lovely boardrooms, all named after wines, by the way, to give you an idea about how nice it is to arbitrate in Canada. Um, and then, of course, uh, Canada is very familiar with all of the arbitration rules that you all know about as well. We use them all the time here uh, for different uh, matters. Uh, people are quite familiar with them, but I would say that the ICC is probably the most used set of rules in, in, in international arbitrations. Uh, we've seen a few LCIA matters as well. The others are all present, but I, I, I do think in my own experience, at least the ICC rules are, are most common and that could be ad hoc or institutional as well. Sometimes we you'll see them without the administration. Um, one last thing on culture, um, and this is particularly important for uh, uh, my friends south of the border. Um, you are used to deposing uh, just about anything that moves in connection with litigation. Um, and in contrast, if you're dealing with British counterparts, they would be at the very other end of the spectrum. Canada, in very typical fashion, is right in the middle. We are the, uh, the true peacekeeping nation in the world, and we compromise wherever we can. And why do I say all of that? If you have an American counterparty to an arbitration agreement and a non-American who might have a less, uh, maybe less accustomed to lots of deposition, and I'm talking about pre-hearing, because you have to understand in international arbitration, Depositions are actually the exception to begin with. Some, some, if not many, international arbitrations are conducted entirely on paper without any viva voce evidence at all. Now, if you have an American party who wants lots of litigation style deposition, they nominate their American, um, let's say it's a three person panel, they'll nominate their American nominee uh, the other party will nominate their, you know, let's say their British nominee, and then they have to pick a president. And they're most likely to prick if you if you've indicated that Canada would be the seat, one of the provinces would be the seat. You're you're there's a very good chance that you're going to wind up with a compromise arbitrator as president who's Canadian and who's familiar with the cultural divergences and is prepared to compromise on either end of the spectrum. So from a, from a business point of view, it's something to, to keep in mind when you're looking at seats and all of the things that flow from the seat of the arbitration. So uh, those are sort of my, my, my Canadian overview comments, Tiara. Thank you very much, Mike. This is very helpful. Um, Chloe, if we could move to you, could you discuss what 
is the legal and statutory scheme for the international arbitration in Canada? Of course. So the starting point for that discussion is really that Canada, like the United States, is a federal jurisdiction with 10 provinces and three territories. And with the exception of Quebec is a common law jurisdiction. Each province and territory, with the exception of Quebec, has governing legislation that governs international arbitration and separate legislation governing domestic arbitration. As I said, the only exception is Quebec, where this is governed by their civil code. If we go to the next slide for a moment, that provides an overview, as well as uh, information about the one federal piece of legislation that deals with um, commercial arbitration, which is the Commercial Arbitration Act that addresses arbitrations involving the Queen in Right of Canada, as well as arbitrations involving the federal uh, crown corporations or departments, which would include then investor state disputes. If we move to the next slide, as Mike was saying, the model law has really become the go-to um, basis for the arbitration legislation across Canada that deals with international arbitration. And the reason for this is that Canada is a signatory to the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arb Arbitral Awards. And that gets ratified through the various provincial pieces of legislation that I was referring to. And each of those pieces of legislation then adopts the model law, either by way of a schedule, as in the case of the Ontario legislation, or simply incorporates the uh, incorporates the model law into the language of the statute itself. In addition, each province um, through its, its legislation has added, usually doesn't subtract from the model law, but has added its own uh, nuances for specific items. If we move to the next slide, we have a chart outlining some of those, um, but there are some additional ones that I, I want to raise because they, they are significant. So, for example, in the Ontario Act, we have the International Commercial Arbitration Act 2017, which makes um, the model law in force in Ontario. And for those who, who don't know what the model law is, because I'm realizing now we've, we've been referring to, to this in shorthand, but it's the model law on international commercial arbitration that was adopted by the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law in 1985 and then amended in 2006. And so in adopting the model law in Ontario, the Ontario legislature has added a few nuances. For example, in section 11 of our International Commercial Arbitration Act, the court has added the ability, sorry, the legislature has added the ability to appeal a finding of no jurisdiction to our Superior Court of Justice. So Article 16.2 of the Model Law provides for appeals from jurisdiction awards in which the tribunal has found that it does have jurisdiction. In Section 11 of our International Commercial Arbitration Act, it provides for an appeal also where there is a finding of no jurisdiction. So that's, that's an example of some of the nuances that can be found in our, in our uh, arbitration acts by province, as well as, as set out in, the, in this slide, the British Columbia legislation has added in a few nuances of its own. And I'm referring to Ontario and British Columbia because as Mike was alluding to, those are really the centers for arbitration in Canada. If we move to the next slide very briefly, as I mentioned, Quebec is a civil law jurisdiction that's not governed by, by uh, common law statutes, but by its civil code. And I'm not a Quebec lawyer, so I will leave it with just what's on this slide, which is that, the, that its code does provide for uh, international arbitration with reference to the model law. 
Sarah, I'll, I'll pass it back over over to you. Thank you, Chloe. This was very helpful. Um, Rachel, if I may ask, for, for contract drafters and negotiators, what do those wanting international arbitration agreements need to consider for their dispute resolution clauses? Thanks, Diora. I'll, uh, I'll ask that the slide deck please be advanced to slide 12. Uh, so this topic, drafting of arbitration clauses, is one of my very favorite topics. One of the reasons for that is, uh, as Mike was discussing the, the legal traditions in Canada around international arbitration, we have a very strong tradition here as well on uh, using ad hoc proceedings for international arbitration. That, of course, has started to be a, a bit diluted over the last few years as we've seen uh, the rise in strength of the various institutions. But it still remains that there are uh, several large transactions and, and large agreements that refer to ad hoc and in the course of doing so, um, spend a fair bit of time on drafting up the arbitration clause therein. These clauses, as some of you may have heard, are frequently dubbed midnight clauses. They are sometimes looked to at the very end of a deal right before signing. Uh, sometimes they're copy and pasted from something similar or something that worked in the, in the past. But in all cases, the dispute resolution clause, in particular when you're looking to international arbitration, is critically important. The reason for that simply is that this is your opportunity to create a process and to set the stage for how disputes under that contract or that agreement uh, will be handled, whether you have the rules and procedures that you want, uh, your ability to uh, pursue the parties that you may need to and have them involved in the dispute, and also your ability to get the relief that you need for your business can all depend on that clause and how that dispute resolution provision is structured. This is also critically important with respect to international arbitration in Canada, because as we've heard from Mike and Chloe, there are a number of well-established rules and varying jurisdictions for international arbitration. So there are a number of options therein. Uh, not only can you consider drafting the dispute resolution clause to help you with this process, but, and, and this is where I really enjoy this topic, you can also use those clauses and tailor that procedure to your advantage. And there can be a very large strategic element in behind how you look at drafting of the arbitration clause. As a very quick and simplistic example of what I'm referring to, if you're looking at entry into a long-term relationship for products or services, and you expect that there might be a number of smaller invoice disputes um, based on history with that type of service or product, and because of the anticipated frequency and relatively simplistic nature, you want a straightforward process for those invoices, but also something that preserves your ability to look at a more robust proceeding if something of a larger dollar value or something of a larger, um, more strategic importance arises, you might want to look at something like the ICDR arbitration rules. Uh, they contain an expedited procedure for claims under uh, $500,000 uh, American. And then they also have rules that provide a, that more robust proceeding for larger or um, higher dollar value threshold matters. And that way you can, you can tailor the dispute resolution clause to something that your business can, can handle for the frequency of those expected smaller matters. Um, moving on, if we could advance to the next slide, please. A few red flags that you might wanna think about when you're dealing with dispute resolution clauses. The first one, of course, is when you're looking at tiered clauses. Tiered clauses are those that include negotiation <clears throat> along with or instead of mediation in advance to arbitration. And those types of tiered clauses can be incredibly useful to manage a dispute and to move the dispute along in the business, get a fresh set of eyes on the problems, advance to other levels of management and try to attempt early settlement. But when drafting, you'll want to take care to ensure that there are clear timelines and start and end points for each step. You don't want to get stuck in a situation where there is a potential argument that a precondition to arbitration has not been met or satisfied. Another really important factor in these dispute clauses is that depending on the dates and timelines involved, you might also want to consider impacts from limitation periods. The provinces and territories in Canada all have varying limitation periods for claims. 
And depending on the applicable law, you could end up not meeting the preconditions to trigger arbitration and bring your claim before the limitation period expires. There are, of course, tolling agreements and other mechanisms to work with that if it looks like you might be in that situation, but it's still something to turn one's mind to early on. Another red flag would be uh, different mechanisms for different disputes within the same agreement. Frequently, we see this with larger transaction documents where there is a uh, provision or carve out for expert determination for technical or accounting type disputes but then the rest of the dispute goes to international arbitration. And I, I, we will talk uh, in more detail shortly about expert determination in Canada. Uh, the point for when you're drafting these types of clauses to keep in mind is that you still wanna make sure that all types of disputes have an appropriate dispute resolution mechanism. So for example, if, if some disputes under a certain section go to expert determination, if there's a dispute about whether that matter is subject to expert determination, you'll want to make sure that that's then covered by the arbitration provision uh, as you're drafting the document, or else the parties can end up uh, in, in quite a, uh, a quagmire. Um, expert determination can be very helpful in certain circumstances, but the keys to remember around that is unlike the statutory regime that Chloe discussed with respect to international arbitration, expert determination is governed by common law. And there is very limited case law in Canada on the ins and outs of expert determination. In addition, if you have a decision through expert determination, that decision uh, is then still just part of the contract. So if there are issues on what that decision means or how it's implemented, it can lead to further disputes down the road. If we could please advance the slides to slide 14. I don't propose to run through all of this slide in detail, but we did want to provide some of the nuance around expert determination in Canada to give some idea on the, uh, the difficulties that can arise if you're incorporating expert determination in your clauses and uh, the, the process around that is not uh, thought through in advance as to uh, what you might wanna cover and, and what could happen if something goes awry. On the next slide, please, just to wrap up this topic, uh, because I, I know my colleagues will have uh, comments on this because it's something we all run into daily. The key items to look for when drafting an international arbitration clause for a contract uh, that is, uh, involves matters in Canada is that there is a binding submission to arbitration, that you have applicable laws and rules, that you have the seat or the place where the arbitration will take place. Uh, that's important to determine which courts will have supervisory jurisdiction, but of course, post pandemic, uh, things happen virtually. So it's not necessarily where you might be actually seated when you're having the dispute. And of course the language. And I have an example up on screen of what we would call a pathological clause and one that you would want to steer clear of because the submission to arbitration is not mandatory. And then on the next slide, on slide 16, we have a few more examples on where sometimes less is more. Uh, while we do have this ad hoc tradition that some lawyers in Canada are very familiar with, there can then be a tendency to craft extremely bespoke and custom arbitration clauses. And sometimes that can uh, raise a lot of red flags in and of itself because there is a greater chance of inadvertently injecting pathological terms or missing key provisions when most of the rules are, uh, are very, very well thought out and, and set out that process quite clearly. Very helpful, Rachel, thank you. Uh, Mike, anything to add about the competing dispute resolution clauses or seats? Uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, and I, I was just looking at the uh, illustrious list of uh, attendees. I see some good friends uh, from both within and, and outside of Denton's. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the cool things we've had here, a bit of an ongoing dis debate over the years, is between ad hoc and institutional arbitration. And for for those of you that are really into into arbitration, you know, theories and, and, and realities as well. It's a, it's a really hot topic because, um, you know, the one stop shop, the, uh, uh, the institutional arbitration clause, of course, brings with it all that wonderful, uh, rule regime. It's all prescribed and you really don't have to worry about too much. And it's sometimes a much easier sell. Uh, 
um, when you're, you know, when you're, you're getting to the, the final strokes of a, a large transaction and who are these pesky litigation and dispute resolution lawyers, you know, worrying about where this should be done and how, and you can just insert, for example, the ICC clause. Now, my friend Bill Horton will tell me that I'm completely wrong when I make that submission. Uh, Bill is one of our most prominent Canadian arbitrators, uh, and uh, he's made a very good argument for the other side that, you know, um, Rachel used the word bespoke. Uh, sometimes you should take the time. Sometimes we see schedules to to very complex agreements where the schedule there is a schedule that actually sets out the specific dispute resolution regime that these two parties have agreed to, and it may be different. And they may, for example, agree to carve out depositions. I talked about that earlier for our American friends. I know you're all in shock and awe again, but it's actually possible to resolve a dispute without a, a single oral discovery. So that's the beauty of this. So there's no right or wrong. Um, and there are some sizes that fit all, but I think our advice to everybody is when you're crafting a clause or they have an opportunity to craft a clause, they should take the time to think about the specific industry that they're in, the specific parties that are involved, the type of dispute that might arise under this particular contract that you're negotiating now, and what then might be the best way to deal with that kind of a dispute uh, in the future. We don't have a crystal ball, but we do have some experience in terms of being able to predict, you know, in a long term supply agreement. What's probably likely to happen? Prices go up. People want to adjust. Oh, we can't supply anymore. And the other side's upset because you're breaching the contract allegedly. And then you might have an arbitration, for example, that's quick and dirty. So anyway, the, the sky really is, uh, is the limit. I wanted to say one other thing uh, earlier. I didn't want people to get the impression that Canada uh, revolves around Vancouver. And Toronto only when we deal about when we deal with commercial arbitration. I'm looking straight at Rachel. Uh, oil and gas, obviously, in the, in the heartland of Alberta, uh, there's a very robust arbitration culture in, uh, particularly in Calgary, uh, and of course in Montreal as well. And one other thing I wanted to mention, as I see Barry Leon's name on my list of people who are here. Thanks for joining, Barry. Uh, Barry and I are uh, on the executive of something called Can Arb Week, uh, which is a not-for-profit organization that we created three years ago to try to emulate the Paris Arbitration Week and the London Arbitration Week and New York and the like. And we're now, we're now, you know, I'm not going to tell you that, uh, that we're competing directly with New York, but we want to be in that. And that that uh, arbitration week is uh, this fall in Canada, and we're doing it in person for the first time. So you'll be able to get more information on the web, and we can circulate that certainly to everybody who is attending. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't point that out as well. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, before we leave the topic, um, Chloe, do you have any stories about the midnight closes? Well, just, just to bring home, I guess, what's already been said, and I, I see the time, so I don't want to take too long with, with anecdotes, but, you know, I think the sky is the limit, as Mike said, but only when you think about things in advance. And I was involved in a matter where the parties had left the dispute resolution clause till the last minute. It was the last thing that they had agreed upon, really almost the day before the agreement was signed. And... Toronto wasn't connected to the dispute, uh, but the, there had been various people involved who had lived in Toronto and they liked Toronto. And as Mike said, it's great here, but hadn't given hadn't given perhaps as much thought to what it meant to have the seat in Toronto. And so um, when when issues arose relating to the arbitration that required supervision of the Ontario courts, um, it was something that the parties hadn't fully contemplated. So just just to reiterate that um, thinking about that in advance is really important, including uh, what role uh, your seat selection plays in terms of the supervision of the arbitration. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, Mike, 
if we come back to the discussion of culture of arbitration, uh, which I found very helpful, um, what are some key issues for business with respect to international arbitration in Canada? Sure. Um, I think, you know, we talked about obviously uh, the right clause, you know, that that obviously is critical. And why is that so important? It, it, it doesn't just simply describe, you know, the mechanics of the arbitration, but the words that are chosen in that clause define a number of things. And, and, and for those that know, apologies, but for those that don't, I think it's important that you grasp this basic proposition. When you indicate what the seat of the arbitration is, you are indicating effectively what court will be supervising the conduct of the arbitration to the extent there is to be any supervision had, which, as you know, is limited, very limited in, in the international setting. But, for example, if you want to talk about set aside uh, or um, um, challenges, uh, those types of things, if you say that the seat of the arbitration shall be Calgary, Alberta, Canada, then you are also saying that any such uh, judicial oversight will be in the Alberta Court of Queen's Bench, which is the, which is the, uh, um, uh, the superior court of first instance in, in that province. And similarly, if you say it's Montreal, it'll be the superior court uh, of Quebec that has that, that oversight jurisdiction. So that's very important. And that's not necessarily where all the arbitration uh, uh, hearings, if there are arbitration hearings, are going to take place. You might have remote witness uh, 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 examinations in Rio de Janeiro for an arbitration that's seated in Calgary, for example. So that's that's not unusual at all. So that's important for the business because the business has to understand what, what are people talking about Toronto and, and Rio de Janeiro in my little example. So often it, I think it's important for business people to understand that. The other big thing is, what is the dispute that is to be referred to arbitration? And here we get into the one of the key things, which is arbitral competence. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we'll unpack this a little bit. Um, what is the arbitrator or the panel to decide? They are going to look at the submission to arbitration to understand what their role is, what their, what their jurisdiction is. Are they allowed to rule on anything? Are they allowed to refer if we're, let's say we're in a common law province, what law are they to apply? Does the contract tell them? Uh, does the contract not tell them? And if it doesn't tell them, do they have the power to decide what should be the substantive law that should apply to the circumstances of this case? Can they make damages awards? Can they grant injunctive relief? All of these types of things. Is the dispute itself one that was contemplated to be arbitrated, or is it carved out by some ambiguous language uh, and reserved for the courts? And so that's what we when we when you hear the term competence competence, it refers to the principle that uh, the arbitral panel has the power, as a matter of custom in arbitration to determine its own jurisdiction effectively. It is competent to define its own competence. And that's not a new, you know, that's, that's a very old uh, proposition, in fact, uh, often litigated, unfortunately, but it is fairly well understood. And you can see, for example, it's in the model law that you see there on the, on the slide, which as Rachel explained earlier, uh, is adopted uh, in various jurisdictions across across Canada and Canada itself, Parliament adopted it, as I said. So if we go to the next slide, I mentioned litigation. Unfortunately, um, sometimes there's a dispute about, um, you know, how far can the panel go? And should a judge really make that determination? And generally speaking, you see there one of uh, the most famous cases from the Supreme Court in this area, the uh, Dell computer case, which came out of Quebec, by the way. Uh, and you can see there that normally, generally speaking, the panel gets to decide uh, the extent of, of its jurisdiction. Um, 
the and the and the, the courts are directed since night since 2007 at least by the Supreme Court of Canada to make sure that generally speaking that rule is enforced i.e let the arbitrator or panel decide and in in more recent times we had the the, the Seidel and the Telus case which was a class action which had its own a whole bunch of uh, interesting issues but uh, they restated the, the the test and you can you can basically there uh, see how it's supposed to go and the most important one really is three if you have a if you have a rec if you need a record to establish what what the question really uh, what the answer to the question is if you have a record that includes some evidence and some law and you know there's there's a bit more than just looking at stuff on, on the on the face of it and deciding then it, it should go to the arbitral panel because they will be better positioned according to our jurisprudence to understand and and I understand that maybe in the US things are a little bit different so we want to flag that for you uh, specifically um, if we go to the next slide um, this comes this is the, this is sort of the latest and we haven't put it here the citation but the Supreme Court of Canada decided a, a, another very important case in this area uh, in respect of Uber uh, and that was, uh, I think now, uh, what, Rachel, about a year and a half, two years ago, something like that. And the, here the question was, you know, an Uber driver um, who uh, signed a contract with Uber in which the contract indicated that they were not an employee, they were self, they were an independent contractor, and importantly, agreed that any dispute arising out of their relationship was to be determined uh, under the uh, rules of the ICC uh, through an arbitration seated in The Hague, Netherlands. Well, there was some evidence that the uh, uh, income of an Uber driver would not even come close to covering the filing fee to start the arbitration. And so the question became, well, one of the questions on that case became, well, what happens in that circumstance when, when uh, one party is insisting that the arbitration clause uh, be uh, adhered to. And the court said, well, wait a minute, um, there have to be limits to this. And so, for example, if somebody can't even afford the filing fee, i.e. the arbitrator is never going to exercise competence, competence, then maybe the courts should jump in at that point. So that's the latest word on that. Um, and of course, I mentioned earlier, there are also limits on arbitrability. Uh, via consumer protection legislation. Famously, one of our former partners, Justice Nordheimer, now of the Court of Appeal, went to the bench and within a year uh, issued a decision that there was nothing to prevent um, uh, a large telecommunications company at the time from enforcing an arbitration clause in a consumer uh, contract. And about uh, 12 minutes later, the Ontario government enacted legislation that said you can't do that. Uh, you can't force consumers to to opt out of court, their right it, to go to court, and so that that type of legislation has been emulated across the country in various other areas. And you see there reference to employment legislation, uh, i.e., Uber. That was another issue in the Uber case, uh, and class proceedings. So there are no waiver, uh, no waiver of class of um, of uh, class proceedings rights in some jurisdictions. So you can't enforce one of those. Uh, no waiver clauses. Um, so I think that's all I was going to um, talk about here, um, unless unless you wanted me to um, expand on any of these issues. Now, this is very helpful, Mike. Um, guess, Chloe, uh, then in light of competence, competence, what about injunctive relief? Does that go to the courts or the arbitrator? So that's a good question. And I think just to back up, a little bit to the point that Mike was making about court supervision. So the courts in Canada will maintain a supervisory jurisdiction over international arbitrations where the seat of the jurisdiction, the seat of the arbitration is in the province. And, and that can mean various things. And I'll touch on three things, one of them being the injunction question that you've just raised. The first uh, follows from Mike's point about competence, competence, in that if you have uh, 
an arbitral tribunal decide their own jurisdiction, at least under the model law and the International Commercial Arbitration Act in Ontario, there would be an ability to appeal that finding on jurisdiction to the Superior Court of Justice in Ontario, and there would be similar rights across Canada, depending on the specific wording of the arbitration statute in that province. So that's one way in which the courts maintain a supervisory role, including with respect to the competence, competence principle. And that, that ties back to one of the comments I made earlier about Article 16 of the model law as supplemented by Section 11 of Ontario's International Commercial Arbitration Act. The second point ties in, Dura, to your question about injunctions, because that's another area where the, the courts in Canada can play a role in, in assisting or facilitating the needs of parties to an arbitration. And the ability for our courts to do that is set out in Article 9 of the model law, which I mentioned has been adopted across Canada. And that provides that it's not incompatible with an arbitration agreement for a party to request before or during arbitral proceedings from a court an interim measure of protection and for a court to grant such a measure. And the need to uh, seek court assistance really varies in part on what procedure has been adopted for the arbitration. Mike was distinguishing ad hoc arbitrations from institutional arbitrations. And this is one area where that decision can affect whether or not you would need to go to the courts to seek an injunction. And that's because for institutional arbitrations, you would likely have adopted a complete set of rules that might facilitate getting um, uh, an injunction from the actual tribunal or from an emergency arbitrator appointed by the institution. And so for that, um, that, this is an area where that choice can really have implications. Having said that, um, you might still need to go to court, for example, if you need to seek injunctive relief against a third party, for example, where you need to freeze assets. Uh, where the, they might not be a party to the arbitration. So there are reasons why the, the courts uh, in the place where you have the seat of arbitration may need to become involved. And there's one fairly recent example of that from Ontario. It's a 2016 case that involved an ICC arbitration. And in that case, the, one of the parties uh, had sought to terminate an agreement relating to a facility in Madagascar. And um, although there were uh, provisions under the ICC rules for the appointment of an emergency arbitrator, the respondent in that case, the party that had terminated the, the contract and had sought to take over management of the facility, um, had dragged its feet and, and essentially prevented the appointment of an emergency arbitrator. And so the claimant in the arbitration also started proceedings in Ontario, which was where the arbitration was seated, in order to get an injunction preventing the responding party to the arbitration from taking over management of the, of the facility. And the court here relied on Article 9 of the model law, as well as Section 28 or of the ICC rules um, by saying that in this case, there was, there was no ability for the, the ICC process to have been followed because the respondent had been dragging its feet and preventing that process. And so the court here granted the injunction, acknowledging that really this this could have and perhaps should have been dealt with by the arbitrator uh, but but couldn't be in in that case and so that's I think a really good example of the courts here facilitating uh, the objectives of arbitration while trying not to intervene too much or accept really where necessary and then the last point of the three points I wanted to mention um, where the courts here, play a supervisory role 
deals with enforcement of arbitral awards under articles 35 and 36 of the model law and and the adoption of the model law is important here because the model law sets out the specific defenses that are available to parties seeking to resist enforcement. And I see that we don't have that much time and still have some stuff left to cover. So I, I, I won't get too much into the detail here, but, but this is one area where our courts look to what other jurisdictions such as the United States and, and the United Kingdom have decided with respect to the meaning and interpretation of the model law in order to inform its interpretation and application of the recognition and enforcement provisions. So to the extent that you have some familiarity um, as parties having arbitrated in the United States, similar types of, of arguments can, can certainly be raised here when dealing with the application of the model law specifically as it relates to recognition and enforcement. Thank you, Chloe, very much for this helpful example. Um, be before uh, we move forward, a a as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, we need to take a brief moment to satisfy CLE requirements by delivering the following code. Uh, so all New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania licensed attendees must type the code word energy into the Q&A section on the right-hand side of your WebEx screen. Uh, please make sure to hit the send button so that it registers. Uh, in case you missed it the first time, the code word is energy. It is on the slide in front of you. Um, and CLE credit for the live webinar is being sought in Arizona, California, Georgia, Illinois, Missouri, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Virginia. Um, so if we could go back to our substantive discussion, uh, Rachel, if I may turn to you, uh, what practical considerations might parties want to think about before agreeing to international arbitration or while in international arbitration process? Sure. Um, thanks, Tiara. If we could please advance to slide number 25, I'll, I'll cover a few of these in the time that we have left. And please don't be shy about sending any questions if you do have those before we break at the top of the hour. Uh, one of the first practical considerations, because as I understand it, it is a difference between the United States and Canada, is that generally in Canada, costs follow the event or costs go to the victorious party. So if you are considering international arbitration in Canada, maybe that's something you're looking for. If not, it might be something that you want to consider uh, drafting around when you are setting up your dispute resolution clause. Another practical consideration with international arbitration that we see uh, on a quite a regular basis, sometimes cause procedural and substantive issues for companies in the process are joinder and consolidation. Where there is more than one dispute that might need to proceed at the same time, or where there are multiple related agreements that might have overlapping disputes that need to proceed through the same process, that can cause certain uh, issues to arise if not thought through at the outset with respect to how to loop in those additional parties and loop in those additional disputes. There are very good joinder and consolidation provisions in several institutional rules, but there are also very strict rules therein around the timing for that joinder or consolidation. In particular, it can be very difficult, if not impossible, to make that happen after the tribunal has been appointed. Another uh, practical consideration that we've seen really uh, quite frequently recently as a result of the pandemic are that international arbitrations have proven to be truly robust and they have not suffered the intermittent delays that have sometimes been seen in disputes before the courts because international arbitration was able to very quickly pivot in spring of 2020 towards proceeding in a, a WebEx or a Zoom or an online format so that travel and the uh, need to sit together in the same room were not uh, impediments to proceeding with matters and business could get disputes resolved. Uh, a few things on that though, and when we have these listed on the slide here, if that is likely something that might happen, you have practical considerations that could result around security, technology compatibility, reliability of Wi-Fi, and also practice um, whether or not counsel are able to brief their witnesses the way they might be used to 
in a common law type system can be different in international arbitration and something you might want to think about. The uh, resounding declarations from the courts in Canada over the last few years have been in support of proceedings going ahead in this format. But if we could please advance to the next slide, there are still some very practical issues around time zones that can be outright bars to proceeding virtually if your arbitral tribunal is placed around the world or parties or key witnesses or experts are placed around the world in a way that it is not possible to meet um, at a, a consistent time or meet for an appropriate length of time and you end up doing the hearing in two hour chunks over several days. Is that really something that the parties would want? Is it better to wait? and have a hearing in person? Or is that something that is factored in at the outset when you are looking at who to appoint for your tribunal and where they might be physically located for when the uh, the merits of the jurisdiction hearing might arise? Uh, there have also been concerns raised with respect to credibility and the ability to truly cross-examine the evasive witness when you're in this virtual format. Um, I think both uh, Mike and I will attest to the fact that that can be uh, easily overcome in most situations, but it still might be a very real issue in some that counsel or clients are not need to are not um, not interested in uh, in pursuing because it, it it is too critical an issue. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues in case they have any parting remarks on the topic. I have I have one thing I wanted to add because this just recently came up. Uh, and another program that uh, the Chartered Institute ran here. And there appears to be um, a little bit of a trend uh, to focus in on the written reasons that the panel delivers when it delivers the award. And um, the award has to be in writing and has to provide uh, the reasons. The loser has to know why they lost. That's the basic, the cardinal rule. And there's been some cases lately that have gotten into that a little, some judicial cases uh, that have gotten into that a little bit. So one of the one of the things that came up in our in that other uh, very good panel discussion we had was about maybe thinking ahead in your arbitration agreement about what the written reasons should include. So that a, the the uh, loser can't later complain about the reasons not following the procedure that the parties agreed to, which is one of the set aside grounds. Remember, there is no right of appeal in an international arbitration, but there is a set aside, sometimes incorrectly, I believe, referred to as judicial review, but it's sort of like that. Uh, in a domestic matter in Canada, you do have some statutes that provide for uh, rights of appeal or leave to appeal, on, on, depending on whether the matter is a question of pure law or mixed 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 uh, fact and law. So just think about that as well. If you're if you're in the moment of drafting an arbitration agreement, should you include some guidance for the benefit of the tribunal and the winner that. Uh, you prescribe a little bit more what the reasons, what the award should should include. Thank you very much. Um, this is really excellent. Um, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, just one more time, a reminder, if you'd like to receive a CLE credit, please type in the word energy in the Q&A section and uh, press send button so it gets registered. Uh, thank you very much, Mike, Rachel, and Chloe, for sharing your insights today about international arbitration in Canada. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And again, the recording of this session will be circulated in the coming weeks.